Hello there. Many thanks for joining us on our special interview series. In today's program, we have a guest all the way from Kingston in Jamaica. I'd like to thank very specially Reverend Dr. Devon Dick, who is the pastor of the Bolivar Baptist Church, Andrew Kingston in Jamaica, and is here with his delectable, beautiful wife, Mary Dick. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you for coming on the program. Thank you, Duke, for having me and myself here. We are delighted to be on your ITV station. I don't know how long you've been married, but like they say, when couples grow older, they begin to look alike. And I see that <laughs> in both of you. We got married December 21, 1985. I'm not sure she'll take it as a compliment that you look alike. <laughs> <laughs> She's beautiful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Mary wants to say something about that, looking back. Yes, all of almost 39 years. Wow. Yeah, we are looking forward to 40 and then 50. It has been good, so we want to have some more years together. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, let's, let's we look at the man, Reverend Dr. Devon Dick. He has a lifelong interest in the institution of national heroes and the church in nation building as evidenced in his Caribbean studies project, William Nabe, a national hero, 1985. Mm -hmm. His postgraduate thesis, Paul Boglo, Prophet Without Honor, 1997, and his PhD dissertation, The Origin and Development of the Native Baptists and the Influence of the Biblical Hermeneutic on the 1865 Native Baptist War, 2008. What's his educational background? Reverend Dr. Davon Dick attended United Theological College of West Indies, 1985-1997, University of Warwick, England, 2008. He holds a Bachelor's of Arts Theology, Master's of Arts Theology, and a PhD in Caribbean Studies. He has been a pastor, Bolivar Baptist Church, October 1992 date. He's been Pastor Fletcher's Grove Circuit of Baptist Churches, July 1985 to September 1990. Part-time lecturer at the Jamaica Theological Seminary and at the United Theological College of the West Indies. He's been Electoral Office Election Clerks in James Northwestern, 1987 to 1990, and St. Andrew North Central, 1990 to 1991 with responsibility for management of general and local elections. He's been a mathematics teacher at Marant Bay High School, 1979 to 1981. Selected preaching engagements across the world includes Jamaica Baptist Union presidential addresses called for a moral agenda, 2018 partnership based on dignity, civility, humility, and community. The Annual Assembly of the Baptist Union of Trinidad and Tobago in 2017. Funeral of Wunra's 17-year-old Violet Moss, then oldest person in the world. Davon Baptist Trailway, 2017. He preached to inmates at the High Security Belmarsh Prison, England. Some overseas assignments include Speaking at the George Leal under the theme Rediscovery of Our African Roots at Progressive National Baptist Convention, Atlanta, USA, 2019. Preached at Jamaica Independence Celebrations in Washington, D.C., USA, 2019. Bethel Baptist Nassau, Bahamas, on the occasion on Bahamian Independence. John Bonian Baptist, Oxford, England, 2016. Ghanaian Baptist Church, 2007, Brixton Baptist UK, New Testament Church of God, George Street, Birmingham. He also has some outstanding speaking engagements and assignments. He's been a keynote speaker at the National Commercial Bank Insurance Blast-Off on the topic of anti-fragility 
in 2019. Spoke at the National Library 40th Anniversary Lecture and Panel Discussion on Crime. King's Cross Baptist Church, London. Riots, Rebellion, and the Black Church. <coughs> Forum for Justice, Cotton Baptist Hall, England, where he questioned the need for UK visa for former ex-RAF Jamaican soldiers in 2017. Emmanuel Baptist, Zimbabwe, 2004. He's authored several books, including Preaching in Jamaican Seasons, Arawak Publications, 2022, Enduring Advocacy for a Better Jamaica, a Collection of Conversations, Arawak Publications, 2019, The Cross and the Machete, The Native Baptists of Jamaican Identity, Ministry and Legacy, Ian Randall Publishers, 2009, mm -hmm. Rebellion to Riot, The Jamaican Church in Nation Building, Revised edition in Randall Publishers, 2004. Rebellion to Riot, the Jamaican Church in Nation Building, Ian Randall Publishers, 2002. His publications include Fairwood in Yes, They Can, Working with Children with Learning and Behavior Disorders, Clara M. Ricketts, 2019, Baptist Life in the Jamaican Church mm -hmm. and Religious Freedom, Caribbean Journal of Evangelical Theology, 13, 2014, pages 39 to 61. The role of the Maroons in the 1865 Maran Bay Freedom War, 444 to 457, in International Journal of Public Theology, edited by Garnet Roper and Esther Reed, volume 7, issue number 4, 2013. Caribbean Theology, a failed project, 191 to 199, in a Kairos Moment for Caribbean Theology, Pickwick Publications, 2013. He written the forward in Kissing the Book, the story of Sam Sharp, as revealed in the records of the National Archives of Kew. Interview with Reverend Dr. Devon Dick on ITV Radio this lovely Monday morning is a must to watch for everyone across the world from wherever you're watching. We say thank you, and please stay with us as we delve into the man, Reverend Dr. Devon Dick, the pastor of the Bolivar Baptist Church in Kingston, Jamaica. Reverend Dick, thank you for coming on the program. Thank you for having us, Duke. And, and Mary Dick, thank you for coming on the program. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, let's begin from the basics, the fundamentals. Uh, I don't know how many days you've been in Nigeria, and I wouldn't know if this is your first time, but... How has the experience been, uh, particularly with the culture, with the people? Yeah, let me start off with uh, Mary. Yeah. Okay, we have been here since last week, Sunday. Okay. Hmm. That's in Nigeria. Well, Devon came over before, because he came for the Baptist World Alliance Convention over in Lagos. I joined a few days later. But we have been having a good time experiencing the culture, especially the food. It is a little different from what we have in Jamaica. Some of the items are the same, but they are prepared differently, and I really enjoy it. I like the fact that they use the, you know, the pepper, the seasoning. It is so it's good. spicy. It is spicy. Okay. Yes. Okay. And we as Jamaicans, we like spicy food because, you know, we have our origin from um, Africa as well, mainly Ghana, Nigeria. Most mm. of our ancestors were from these, these parts. So we are really enjoying it. And the... Generally, I find the people are just as pleasant and warm and welcoming as they are in Jamaica. So we really feel at home. So it's really good to be here. Fantastic. My, my wife is a foodie. She likes food. <laughs> and so she can tell us some of the foods that she okay. likes here. Okay. So oh. why are you in Benin City? <laughs> why are you in Nigeria? You want to share some thoughts with us, Reverend? Well, uh, over a year ago, I was invited by... His Excellency, Sir Dr. Gabriel Ibignion. Ibignion. Ibignion, yes. The SMA of the Benin Kingdom and his wife, Lady Cherry, Her Excellency. So we had that invitation for a while. Then, in addition, the Baptist World Alliance Congress was being held in Lagos in July of this year. And providentially, our first and only grandchild, Abigail Oladipo, 
her birthday is this month being celebrated in Lagos. My youngest daughter is married to Dr. Rashid Foncho Oladipo, Nigerian born, and they have the first grandchild. So it's a threefold mission. As I said, we're invited by the SMA of Benin Kingdom and Lady Cherry. The Baptist World Alliance Congress being held in Lagos last week, and our grand, the celebration of our grandchild's first birthday. Fantastic. Uh, you, you've been in ministry for so long. What's your, how would you describe the challenge of the church in today's world in view of some of the things that are happening globally? Well, one of the major challenges is for there to be peace. And what the discussion at the Baptist World Alliance Congress in Lagos, the theme was ambassadors for peace. And this is a very important issue at this time in our life. As you know, within the New Testament, peace is used in different ways. For example, peace can be described as the absence of conflict, the absence of war, the absence of chaos. It can also be described as a right relationship with God, or a good relationship among people. It's also a state of mind, having this satisfaction and this fulfillment. And it, in addition, is a, is a greeting, hello. And we are finding that worldwide, there are so many conflicts. If you look at the Middle East, between Israel and Palestine, Eastern Europe, between Russia and Ukraine, you have conflict in Africa, the Sudan, or the Democratic Republic of Congo. And you have you know, so, much, so many things that can disturb the peace, whether it's kidnappings, abductions, whether it's a high cost of living, whether it's corruption or political tensions. You know. So we have to endeavor that people live in peace. We are all made in the image of God. And so we don't want to be killing others. We must live as one so that everybody can prosper in body and in soul. Fantastic. Uh, Mary, I'm sure you want to share a thought along those lines on the challenge of the church in the world, particularly the seeming evasiveness of peace. <clears throat> well, I, one, one passage I always remember when Jesus said, "My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, but you know. And that to me is very significant because he was leaving his disciples and he was said, I give you my peace. That means the way that we ought to live, we ought to live well with each other because there's a relationship, you know, from man to God and across for man to man. You know, so it is important that the church engenders peace at all times. They need to teach the lesson to others that we need to live in peace, not be at war. Because when we are at war, there is so much different, you know, factions and people are just against, they'll be just people killing each other. That's not what God intends for us. He intends for us to live together as one people. It doesn't matter which nation, because he wants to make us into one nation. Yeah, we ought to be peacemakers. Mm. You know, we ought to be peacekeepers. Okay. And whenever we don't see peace, it is incumbent on us to try to make peace between warring factions. And sometimes it's even within a family. It might even be within a congregation. But we must make a special effort to bring par parties together so that they can be reconciled as one, so that they are more productive. Mm -hmm. When you are in conflict at the workplace, or in a home, you cannot produce your optimum. So we realize that we need that quality peace wherein there is that contentment, wherein that there is this agreement. It's not talking about uniformity. It's just talking about unity. And we must try our very best to live peacefully with each other. Quickly talk to us about your um, assessment of the impact of Baptist mission 
on global evangelism. The, at the Baptist World Alliance annual gathering in Lagos, we recognize that Baptists are on a decline in Europe and in the United States of America. But thankfully, hmm. Baptists are growing in Africa. The influence that Baptists should have is waning, especially in Europe and USA. But we see that Baptists can have a significant impact in Africa, in Jamaica, and in the Caribbean. We realize that in Nigeria, they have a vast convention center, can hold up to 50,000. They, they, they are involved in establishing schools, in planting churches, Central Baptist Church, as has this goal to plant four to five churches in seven years. They have a bank. So with all of these instruments, these economic development, with engaging the young people in fulfilling their educational needs, that influence can be significant. Uh, Mary, you, you want to talk to us about the influence of Baptist Church using Jamaica as a case study. Okay, the Baptist Church in Jamaica has been very good. It, when it started out, basically, when George Lyle came to Jamaica over 200 years ago, and he decided to start back, it was mainly geared towards the enslaved or those who were just about being freed. So it was mainly for those persons who were not seen as the upper class. And the Baptists have grown so much, and they have helped with the development of the nation, because I'll the church in general, and the Baptist church in particular, helped with developing schools for the children of you know, the freed slaves. And they and free even now, too. and they established free villages, okay. free villages. And even now, most of the traditional high schools that are Baptist related are doing very well. And persons really aspire to go to some of these schools mm. because of the quality education okay. that they offer. So the church has helped in the development of education, they have helped in the development of financial services. You know, because even the first building society. building society was started by the church, the first credit union was started by the church, and even the first life insurance company was influenced by the church. So the church, the Baptist church, and because one of our national heroes, George um, William Gordon, he was one of the persons who started that life insurance company, and he was a Baptist minister. You know, so the, the, the Baptist church has been very influential in the entire fabric, building the fabric of our society okay. in Jamaica. Okay, you mentioned a while ago that there's been this decline. What are the factors responsible for this decline in numerical strength of uh, Baptists, like you recorded a few minutes ago? Uh, what do you think can be done to change the narrative? Well, in, in Jamaica in particular, the Baptists were like a trade union. They agitated on behalf of the working class for better salaries, better working conditions. And the 1831 Baptist War was about freedom, but it was also about getting wages and that they should get an extra day holiday, better working conditions. Mm -hmm. However, you found, you found that later on, trade unions and political parties took over that role. So the connection between the working class or the working class people and the church was broken. Mm. So by the time you reach 1942 onwards, the influence of the church on the population declined. So what needs to happen again is that even though you have trade unions and political parties on behalf of the working class, mm. the church must identify with the struggles of the people, where they are itching, where they are hurting, and then again, you'll see the influence growing. Um, Reverend, you've 
authored several books and you've had the privilege and the opportunity of speaking at several conferences and um, several events, just like you did, by the way, yesterday at Central Baptist Church, Help from Help Beyond Borders was awesome, was outstanding, and very, very impactful. But let's sh hear from you. Um, based on these activities you've had the opportunity of doing, uh, either as an author or as a speaker or as a preacher, which of them has had a very, very profound impact on you personally? Yes, I have authored four books, and in fact, yesterday I presented one of the books, Preaching in Jamaican Seasons, to the SMR of the Benin Kingdom, and he said he's going to put it in the, his archives. That, that is a collection of sermons I've preached over the years, especially presidential address, addresses when I was the president of the Jamaica Baptist Union. And I was calling for a moral revolution based upon a partnership, respect for each other, dignity, building up the community. And that was a very important work. My first book was the Jama Rebellion to Riot, the Jamaican Church in Nation Building. I was the first Jamaican to write a book about the collective presence in the church, not denominational, collective presence and power. Looking at the church's contribution in terms of education, because the church has started education, not, not the state, mm -hmm. for the education of the masses. Look at the role of the churches in building homes, houses, because when the, the Jamaicans got freedom, they got no land, they got no money, they got no school, they got no government. So it was important that the church laid that foundation and the role the church played in growing the number of churches in Jamaica. My, my second book came out of my PhD thesis that I did at the University of Warwick, which looked at the contribution of two of our national heroes, namely Paul Bogle and George William Gordon. The national heroes they interpreted scriptures differently from the missionaries. The missionaries interpreted scriptures and said to the blacks, hold your corner, wait your turn, don't agitate for freedom, <laughs> be hardworking, be disciplined. However, when you look at how Paul Bogle George William Gordon and even and Sam Sharp interpreted scriptures was different. They are saying that you have a right to be free. Mm. You have a right to good working conditions. You have a right to protest against injustice and inequality. So that to me is very, very significant that we understand ourselves as made in the image of God and having that opportunity to agitate that we are all equal and justice for all. My third book was Enduring Advocacy for a Better Jamaica. It is a collection of my articles over 25 years as a weekly columnist for the Gleaner, the largest newspaper in Jamaica and in the Caribbean, and which my wife worked for for 25 years. <laughs> and that book dealt with different issues, whether it's on religion, whether it's on finance, whether it's on sports, but it's on Jamaican heritage. And that book is being used in the University of the West Indies, in Jamaica, Trinidad and Barbados, in a foundation course for law, economy, and society. Hopefully, the younger generation yeah. will learn and understand where we are coming from as a people okay. and what we need to do now to make it a better society, a gentler society, a kinder society, and a more prosperous and peaceful society. Fantastic. Um, how would you describe the impact of these books, messages, preachings, speaking activities? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've had the opportunity to go with Reverend some of them. And, and what is it like marrying a man like him who is so... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that you ask that question because when I was marrying him, I was marrying him as Devon. <laughs> Not as a preacher, <laughs> not as an author. <laughs> as a so how are you able to cope with that transition? 
I actually took it in stride. I did not see him in the different category. I just saw him as my best friend. Mm. So it made it easy for me to you know, work with him. I was always his biggest critic and his biggest supporter. <laughs> 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 because when he writes, I would read every single article that he would write for the newspaper. Mm. I would read everyone. I would read his rule, then if I'm not sure, I'd question some things when he puts it down as fact. I question them. I say, you know, if I question it, then other people would question it. So therefore, he has to clarify before it goes out to the public. Yeah. And the same thing for his books. I read every single chapter because I just want to make sure that it was okay. I am not an, a journalist, <laughs> not an I, editor. I understand. But I just have to make sure, yeah. you know, because when he goes out, I just want to make sure that whatever he puts out there in writing must be reflective of him as a person because I believe that he, whatever he's putting out is part of his brand and his brand must be well built and must be well protected Absolutely. when he goes out there. So that was part of my role. And it was easy to cope with him because he always takes the lead, you know, up front. And as I say, I'm there as his biggest supporter. And I just have to ensure that what he does, you know, is really good and really depicts what he's really about. Yeah. And he's, he has certain standards, and therefore we don't question his standards. Okay. Because he's always, you know, above board at all mm. times, mm. ensures that whatever he writes, whatever he says, whatever he does, everything is working together. He doesn't say one thing and then go and do something yes, differently. Fantastic. Fantastic. You know? So it makes it easy for, for, for us to work with him, not only just me as the wife, yeah. but for the children yeah. as Absolutely. well, because they understand what their father stands for. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? And so they stay in line. Thank God all three children are God-fearing. Mm -hmm. They are still in the church, very active, and do all they need to do in support of his ministry. ministry. And, you know, going out with him and speaking engagements, very, very, you know, awesome, I should say. Yeah. You know, because when he goes out there, to see the level of respect that people have for him and mm. they hold him in high esteem mm. because they know of his words, when they, especially when they read his articles in the newspaper and they know what his thought process is like. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It is Fantastic. very good. Fantastic. Well, um, what she did tell her that sometimes mm. she reads some of the sermons too. <laughs> 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 from the articles and books. Okay. So uh, you, you've been a guest to His Excellency, the Honorary Romanian Consul to uh, Do and Death to State, uh, Chief Dr. Gabriel Osawari Benedian, in the last couple of days. What's your perception of his persona, his personality, the impact that he's made on humanity? Well, yeah. he is very warm, very hospitable, and very kind. I, first I was meeting him and having lunch with him on, uh, on Sunday again, it was the second time. He is very easygoing and you feel very comfortable in his presence. And I was delighted to find out that he was the uh, major contributor financially to the struggle for the great late President Nelson Mandela in this struggle against apartheid and for his freedom. So he's that type of person. He's always willing to, to help people and that is mm -hmm. fantastic. Mm. And his wife, Her Excellency Lady Cherry, is that his family. She, she talks to my daughter who is married to a Nigerian giving advice. She gives me advice also <laughs> and what to do and what to say, and she's an excellent planner, mm -hmm. making sure that my stay here, our stay here, is comfortable and is rewarding. Fantastic. And I thank them very much. Okay. Um, the House of Ibnidio more or less has um, strengthened the bond of friendship between Nigeria and Jamaica by reason of Lady Cherry's yes. heritage and all that. You want to say something on that quickly? Well, before I go on to, say, to speak on that, okay. I'll just speak on um, the Esama himself. I was reading earlier in this book, The Blue-Blooded, and I just found out from the person who wrote that section at the front, the first testimony, testimonial, you know, that his 
the assignment, not just for a particular group, but just for everybody. Mm -hmm. He helps everybody. And not only with just financial assistance, but help to build up their character as well, you know, by the things he would do and say. So that is very good. In terms of the relationship between Jamaica and Nigeria, well, we are so happy that Lady Cherry, you know, is, is a part of this, the House of Ibinion, and that she is the one who is very instrumental in getting us here. And we know that, you know, with her relationship with the former Prime Minister of Jamaica, PJ Patterson, you know, that has also helped to build our relationship. So we knew her even before we actually met her. Okay, okay. <laughs> And the fact that, you know, we knew one of our best friends, she has a very good friend in London, you know, Paulette, who has been like a liaison, you know, that has also helped. And then when Lady Cherry spoke to us yesterday, and tell us about her relationship with our daughter, who lives in London, one is back to mm. Nigeria. And she says she actually takes our daughter as her daughter. Mm. It's her responsibility, having had her, you know, uh, having her marry a, a Nigerian, okay. you know. So it helps to cement that relationship between Jamaica and Nigeria. And we look forward to greater partnerships. Fantastic. Because we know there will be more. And Fantastic. even on a personal mm -hmm. note, my son, my, our only son, uh, is a physiotherapist by profession. profession okay. But he is a bodybuilder and he represents Jamaica bodybuilding in tournaments mm. and he wants to come to Nigeria oh fantastic because you have a bodybuilding show here I oh, think fantastic. It's in November fantastic so fantastic one day you might meet him mm. but most time people think of Jamaica yeah uh, people just think that you know the average person in Jamaica or from Jamaica uh, loves reggae because of the uh, impact <laughs> of the great Bob Nestamali and mm -hmm. several others I, I, I don't know if you want to say something about that briefly Reverend Yes, Bob Marley's perhaps best known and greatest song, One Love, in which he's calling upon the world to live in unity as one. And it is like a national anthem. Anywhere you go, people will play that song. In fact, I remember I was preaching in London at a charismatic Baptist church. And after I preached, the song for closing that they used was One Love. Mm. So One Love is known worldwide. worldwide, and Bob Marley is easily the most famous Jamaican. Bob Marley, Marcus Messiah, Messiah Garvey, our national hero, and you also have Usain Bolt there. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. Bob Marley is the top one. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Dr. Devon Dick. Uh, it's been a delight talking with you here today. Pleasure. And Mary Devon Dick. It's been Thank a pl so pleasure much. having you here as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, it's been awesome uh, sharing some thoughts with uh, our guest here on this special interview series. I want to thank you for watching. I want to say big thanks to uh, His Excellency Sir Chief Dr. Gabriel Osawao Ibnijo and his beautiful wife, Her Excellency Lady Cherry Ibnijo, for facilitating this conversation. <laughs>